Welcome to video two in the Cure Insomnia video series. How to change deeply rooted beliefs and make sleep less important to stop the spiral. So this video is about building strong belief systems for making sleep less important, making deep, refreshing sleep easier to get, and creating more energy and happiness during the day. There's three huge methods for making sleep less important and stopping the downward spiral. These are, one, a simple works every time way to make sleep less important by turning any problem into an opportunity. And that's what we talked about in video one in the series. Second is making sleep far less important and becoming more rational with your beliefs by determining the difference between how much sleep you need and how much sleep is ideal. Third, making sleep far less important by taking your life back from insomnia in part by discovering how virtually all insomniacs put exhaustion in the center of their lifestyle and how to change to lead a more balanced lifestyle, even with extreme exhaustion. And this includes counteracting the negative effects of sleep that sleep deprivation has on your health, and doing some simple daytime exercises that will improve your sleep and your health at the same time. So in this video, we're going to talk about those second two. Now, put simply, if you don't have a strong belief system, you won't have the groundwork to be able to fall asleep at night and create energy during the day, which are the keys to making sleep less important and curing insomnia. To illustrate the power of beliefs, here's an astonishing example of two insomniacs that approach their days from entirely different perspectives. Marcus, and I've changed the names here, is a young man who was one of the first insomniacs I ever talked to. And the interesting thing about Marcus was that he considered himself a serious chronic insomniac, even though he'd normally get six or more hours of sleep with relatively few awakenings throughout the night. Marcus believed they needed eight hours of sleep to have energy um, that he needed for optimal performance in his career as an investment banker. His job was stressful and he felt like po the poor sleep he was getting was holding him back from getting promoted and even put him at risk of being fired. Throughout the day, Marcus had to take long breaks to recover from the energy he spent. He never had enough energy. He didn't like energy drinks because he claimed that the crash was terrible. Well, as it turns out, Marcus has never really needed eight hours of sleep per night. In fact, he's hardly an insomniac at all. What Marcus really suffered from was his own belief system that he didn't have enough energy. Marcus is an example of someone who does and believes one thing, even though it's clear, even though there's clear, obvious proof that he's very wrong in his belief. There was one especially important day where Marcus proved this. On this day, he told me that he woke up feeling literally disoriented and that he felt that uh, he was in for a very exhausted, bad day. And then something crazy happened at work. It was a while ago, but I think one of his stocks failed or something. Anyway, it was a disaster. All day long, he was making business calls, fixing things, and getting much more stuff done than normal. After work, he said he was completely worn out, but when I asked about his energy during work, he reported that he never felt tired for a second, and he actually felt great during the day. I pointed out that it was very interesting that he was normally so exhausted that he had to take a break after every task he did. Yet on the most stressful day, most exhausting day of the year, he didn't feel tired for a second. Marcus was still convinced that he was somehow exhausted all day. He said, I only had energy because I needed to have it. The reason Marcus is a breakthrough example is that it doesn't matter why he had energy. What matters is that he was able to create it. He's one of the reasons I spent so many years developing this content because I knew that he, if he could create energy like that, it could be done at will. You can choose to create that kind of energy. Marcus illustrates the power of a belief. A belief is so strong that even in the face of irrefutable evidence, Marcus still couldn't believe that he really had energy. Even though everything was backwards, he had far more energy when work got harder, he created energy on a day that was full of stress start to finish, and despite the hardest working conditions he's ever been in, he enjoyed the day a lot more than a normal day. It should have been clear to Marcus that sleep wasn't the problem. 
It was his resigned attitude towards his day. So now here's an example of an elderly woman who I've changed her name to Clara, who's quite the opposite of Marcus. Clara had a terrible case of insomnia. She was kept awake all night by some rather feminine issues I won't go into, as well as beliefs that had grown on her that sleep was just a very difficult part of life. The great thing about Clara is that, to this day, she's one of the people I've helped whose biggest problem with sleep was having too much energy, even into the night. Clara is an elementary school teacher who, in her free time, volunteers at the child care center and does a lot of community service work for the city and school district. She has a way of keeping herself busy all day long. Clara's belief regarding energy is, no matter how tired I get, I have never run completely out of energy unless I faint from exhaustion one of these days, I never will. Clara always thinks in terms of more. She wants to do more, have more energy, and be able to focus on more things. That's why she subscribed to my website. Does Clara take breaks? Of course she does. But unlike Marcus, she never believes that she has to. With less than half the sleep of Marcus, she can always do a little more, push a little bit harder. She believes that there is a great abundance of energy in the human soul. Clara has told me that there's been times when people told her, told her that she absolutely had to take a break. There's been times when she didn't even hear someone talking to her because she was too exhausted to focus, and she was told that she had to take a break because she wasn't proper, properly supervising the children she was watching. As she, she says, though, I don't know why they thought that. I felt fine. Kind of that little denial there. Claire's belief is so strong that even when she's too exhausted to work, she'll actually rationalize that she has plenty of energy. The most important idea regarding beliefs is that our beliefs become our reality. There's a guy named Robert Anton Wilson who wrote a book called Prometheus Rising, and in his book he has this great quote that says, Whatever the thinker thinks, the prover proves. My take on it is that what he's saying is our mind is set up in such a specific way that it focuses its attention on finding real-world evidence of our beliefs. So no matter how far-fetched the belief is, if it's an unwavering belief, your mind will find real-world evidence to back up the belief. Whether it's true or not, you're going to find evidence and believe it's true. So I'd like to do a simple exercise just to demonstrate this. Okay, I want you to become aware of everything in your room or wherever you are that's red. Just take a few moments right now, pause the video, spend maybe two minutes and really look around carefully for everything that's red. Okay, now close your eyes and I want you to recall everything that was red. Pause the video for a minute and uh, really spend a minute doing this before moving on. Okay, now that you've imagined all the red things in the room, close your eyes again. Are your eyes closed? Okay, now I'll give you a little time to do this one so you don't have to pause the video. So keep your eyes closed, and now I want you to recall everything in your environment that was yellow. Okay, done? Now I bet you could remember more red things and yellow things since that's where your focus of attention was. Beliefs work in the same way. Once you believe something, your mind only looks for supporting evidence. It's not natural for it to notice things that contradict with the belief. Start thinking about other beliefs. Think about what evidence the following ideas and beliefs would find and how they would make sleep more important. So let's just look at a few of these here. The first one, I hardly got any sleep last night. How would you find evidence to support that? How would that make sleep more important? Second, I need eight hours of sleep to feel well rested. Three, my insomnia is going to, be, is going to result in other health problems. Four, I'm distressed at bedtime. 
Five, why is sleep so much easier for everyone else? Six, I feel horrible because I didn't get good sleep. Seven, how will I operate after such a bad night of sleep? Eight, I can't fall asleep without taking a sleeping pill. Nine, I don't think I can fall back to sleep. Ten, oh no, I'm awake. Eleven, this is going to be another night of insomnia. Twelve, my insomnia is getting worse. 13. I need more sleep. Now, the power question is, what evidence can you find to support the following pro-sleep ideas and beliefs, and what will that do for you? So, let's take some pro-sleep. The first one is, I always fall back to sleep sooner or later. How could you find supporting evidence for that? What would it do for you if you could find supporting evidence for it? Two, I need less sleep than I thought. Three, my sleep is getting better and better. Four, my sleep will be improving as I learn these techniques. Five, if I get my core sleep, I'll be able to function during the, uh, during the day. And we're gonna look at that later, but basically the first two sleep cycles or about the first three hours of sleep have been shown to make up 90% of the sleep that your body needs. They do that with cognitive testing and they, they test all kinds of things at sleep centers and they've done thousands of tests that show, hey, you know, you get those first three hours of sleep, pretty much work, uh, the next day you've got 90% of all your cognitive functioning. So why does it feel like you only have 50%? Hmm, could it be that you're finding evidence to support a belief that you only have 50% energy? Remember, no idea is 100% true and so you shouldn't be trying to trick yourself into changing beliefs. All you want to do is to start seeing things differently. Make sleep a little less important, 1% at a time, by breaking down evidence that supports anti-sleep beliefs. Now work with what you can, first of all. And build evidence to support pro-sleep beliefs. For now, just start to notice that your mind is set up to believe in getting the ideal amount of energy. Just like both Marcus felt like he needed energy and Claire always wanted more. But as long as you can create energy, you don't actually need sleep. You just prefer it. The roots create the fruits. In the last video, you learned that all sleep solutions don't work as well as they should because of deeper level beliefs and behaviors that prevent sleep. The question is, how do you change them? Imagine a tree. Let's suppose this tree represents your sleep. On this tree, there are fruits that never seem to grow ripe and delicious. These fruits represent the results you're getting with your sleep, your exhaustion. So we look at the fruits and we don't like them. There aren't enough of them, they grow too slowly, they're too small, and they don't taste good. So what do we tend to do? Most of us put even more attention and focus on the fruits, our results. But what is it that actually creates those particular fruits? It's the seeds and roots that create those fruits. It's what's under the ground that creates what's above the ground. It's what's invisible that creates what's visible. So what does that mean? It means that if you want to change the fruits, you will first have to change the roots. If you want to change the visible, you will have to change the invisible. With your sleep, what you cannot see is far more powerful than anything you can see. The way it works in nature is that if your unconsciousness is at unrest, your consciousness will not be able to rest. To change the roots, you'd have to change the parts of your unconsciousness which see sleep as important because that's what's making speedy brain waves happen all night long. To get a picture of the roots you'd have to change, we can look at a process that many respected teachers use in their teachings. Called the process of manifestation, it goes like this. Beliefs lead to behaviors. Behaviors lead to feelings. Feelings lead to actions, and actions lead to results. Applied to sleep, it works the same way. Belief that sleep is important leads to behaviors like worrying about problems. Worrying about your problems leads to feeling anxiety or feeling depressed. Feeling anxiety or feeling depressed leads to actions like trying harder, struggling to get comfortable, and trying to force techniques or pills to work. And actions like struggling lead to fragmented sleep. Even after you fall asleep, your mind continues to struggle. The beliefs, behaviors, feelings, actions, and results carry on. While that sounds hopeless, it's actually a good thing. It means your mind never stops working for you. You just have to learn to make it work for you in a way that's helpful. 
To stop the downward spiral of insomnia, you just have to change the roots. What if it looked like this? What if you had beliefs that said sleep isn't important? It would lead to calming, relaxing thoughts or behaviors, which would lead to feelings of relief and comfort, which would lead to slow brainwave actions like relaxing, resting, and letting go, which would lead to more solid, refreshing sleep. Right now, you're probably doubting that's even possible to change your deeply rooted beliefs about sleep. At the very least, it doesn't seem easy. The goal of this video is to show you that it's possible to see sleep as less important and to get you to start ending the oppression of the downward spiral of insomnia. It will take time, effort, and proper instruction. An extra time to practice is something that insomnia gives you plenty of. The question is, would you rather spend that time struggling and keeping yourself more awake, or would you like to use it to work on yourself? Evicting exhaustion from the center of your life. Exhaustion does more harm than it appears to. If left unchecked, exhaustion will run your life. We're gonna look at this more in depth in this video and we're going to look at two new spirals that you can use as practical maps for improving your sleep. The key behind all this new information is another downward spiral called the tiredness cycle. The spiral explains how focusing on exhaustion causes more exhaustion in an endless circle. This is kind of scary information because it's kind of like seeing the prison bars for the first time. For a lot of people, they're, seeing that they're stuck in an endless loop is depressing. Don't worry about it though. Seeing the cycle is only the first step. Once you know what's going on, you can finally do something about it, which is what this all, what, which is what this video is all about. And really, this is um, like the first step to freedom. If you can't see the bars, how can you escape them? Most insomniacs have the spiral running right in the center of their lives. Everything they do is with consideration of how much energy they have. To break out of the spiral, you'll have to evict it from the center of your life. So to give you better, a better idea of what we're talking about here, I want to share with you the center of the universe misconception, which comes from a program called Mastery by Eben Pagan. Until Copernicus came along in the late 1400s and early 1500s, the common belief was that the Earth was at the center of the universe and that everything else revolved around it. When Copernicus challenged this idea, he wasn't just challenging an astronomical belief. At the time, many different beliefs from how heaven and hell were structured to Aristotle's physics to the basic concept of the egocentric self-importance were all based on this model of the universe. The devil was at the center of the earth and hell, stones fell because the place for heavy bodies was at the center of the universe, and we were the important rulers of the physical world. The idea that the earth revolved around the sun was not only something that required a person to realize that they weren't so very important in the big scheme of things and change their views on reality, but more importantly, it was publicly seen as blasphemy against God, literally punishable by death and eternal damnation. To accept that the Earth was not at the center of the universe basically meant that one would have to change their view of how reality worked and accept the possibility of going to hell for the lack of faith. Quite scary. To explain differently, if you lived 500 years ago, then you were raised with the idea that the Earth was at the center of the universe and that everything from your, and everything from your view of God and religion to your view on physics and the nature of reality was based on that belief. To even entertain the idea that this wasn't true was unac unacceptable and scary. Exhaustion isn't at the center of the universe. Break the spiral. In modern times, insomniacs carry around a view that is hauntingly similar to the center of the universe misconception. Most insomniacs have a program that comes from a long, frustrating battle with insomnia that goes something like this. By the way, by program, I mean a belief system. Exhaustion prevents me from living the way I want to live. In life, I need to get better sleep because when I'm exhausted, everything is a challenge and life isn't as good. My exhaustion prevents me from living well and happily. This program or set of beliefs forms a model that looks like this. The sleep-centric model. You can see there that getting sleep and dealing with exhaustion is in the center. That's what everything gets focused around, how much energy you have. 
Then there's the way you behave is directly hooked into that. Your objectives have to be based on your behavior and your exhaustion and your life goals are based on what objectives you can achieve because of the behaviors and all the exhaustion you have going on. This is just how we have to naturally structure things when we're so tired that we can't get as much done. We have to, you know, start, insomniacs tend to start structuring their life around their exhaustion. Most insomniacs walk around as if exhaustion were at the center of their universe. Many of their beliefs, thoughts, actions, and communications clearly demonstrate this. In fact, it's even wired into our culture in a thousand different ways. The common inaccurate information we hear all the time is that you need eight hours of sleep per night to function properly. It is commonly known that if you don't get enough sleep, you won't have good enough focus and energy. We hear from our friends, our teachers, our parents, our boss, our mattress companies, our television sets, even our doctors, that sleep is essential to having energy. In fact, many of us have been raised with these ideas and programmed to think this way all our lives. This key fallacy causes us to blame our problems on insomnia, complain about lack of energy all the time, and justify our shortcomings in life with our exhaustion. All these things put exhaustion right smack in the center of our universe. Exhaustion does cause these things, but it's only because we unknowingly cause it to. We cause our own exhaustion to become a hor such a horrible central issue in our world without even realizing that we're the ones doing it. It's actually obvious when you take the time to think about it. When exhaustion gets so much of our attention, it doesn't exactly fade into the background. Insomniacs that really have their life together in every way are not limited by their exhaustion. Thomas Edison is a great example. Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, was not a great mathematician, however he was great at tests and experimentation. Although he suffered from se severe chronic insomnia, he ran hundreds of experiments that each required extreme precision, precision to invent a working light bulb. Edison would, off, would often joke that sleep was a waste of time. Had he been constantly focused on his exhaustion, do you think he would have had the precision required to do a hundred or hundreds of experiments with like tiny wires of all sorts? If solving exhaustion had been more important to Edison than solving the light bulb, I have my doubts that he would have ever finished his work himself. Insomniacs like Thomas Edison are rare. How many insomniacs have you heard of that don't care about their exhaustion? How many insomniacs ha have their life totally together and are in total control of their health, emotions, effectiveness, skills like communication and leadership, and are interesting, enjoyable people overall? Most, in most people have never heard of an insomniac who had their lives totally together, but they've heard of heard of or know quite a few people who have trouble sleeping. Insomniacs are everywhere, but one that really has their life together is very rare. Becoming bigger than your own exhaustion and living a powerful life goes hand in hand with breaking the downward spiral. To break the spiral, it's very important to move exhaustion from the center of your life to just one of the details about your life as displayed by the following model. And this is the life goal centric model. And the idea here is that we shouldn't be, you know, running our objectives, goals in life and behaviors around ex how much energy we have or how exhausted we are. We should be taking control ourselves, choosing what we really want and making it happen and having exhaustion just be something that influences our ability to work. It's not something that we plan around. Turning focus to your life's goals moves exhaustion back into orbit around your balanced universe. It's often daunting and uncomfortable changing a key belief and perspective like this and to entertain the idea that you could have been wrong all your life. But once you stop looking at and treating exhaustion as if it were all powerful over your energy and focus and instead realize that the key is in yourself it has all kinds of magical effects. It starts to break the habit patterns of thoughts and behaviors that put exhaustion in control of you. It helps you realize that your mind is just desperate to fill its focus with the most powerful ideas and emotions and that you can control what those ideas and emotions are. It causes you to take responsibility for your thoughts and results. 
causes you to open up your mind to the idea that there's a way to grow an ability to be clearly focused and you can enjoy your days more and more until your exhaustion becomes unimportant, leaving you with a more positive, refreshing outlook on life. The earth is not at the center of the universe and neither is exhaustion, so stop acting like it. Installing new beliefs, the science of exhaustion and the 80-20 rule. One way to make sleep far less important is to create energy during the day and conquer exhaustion. When exhaustion isn't determining how you live your life, sleep isn't nearly as big of a deal. So this is by far some of the most important concepts you'll need if you want to cure insomnia. The 80-20 rule or Petro's law was invented by economist Valvredo Petro and applies to all sorts of things in life, including the energy you gain from sleep. The law can be summarized as follows. 80% of the outputs come from 20% of the inputs. It applies to all kinds of things in life. And if you really want to get a good idea of this, you can read about it. It's a really common concept. Betterexplained.com has a great explanation that goes kind of like, uh, I'll just read their quote here. They say, more generally, the Petro principle is the observation, not law, that most things in life are not distributed evenly. But be careful when using this idea. First, there's common misconception that the numbers 20 and 80 must add to 100. They don't. So 20% of the workers could create 10% of the result, or 50%, or 80%, or 99%, or even 100%. Think about it, in a group of 100 workers, 20 could do all the work while the other 80 goof off. In that case, 20% of the workers did 100% of the work. Remember that the 80-20 rule is a rough guide about typical distributions. Also recognize that the numbers don't have to be 20% 80% exactly. The key, thing, the key point is that most things in life effort, reward, output, are not distributed evenly. Some contribute more than others. What does it mean when we say things aren't distributed evenly? The key point is that each unit of work or time doesn't contribute to the same amount, or doesn't contribute the same amount. Here's some examples. If the richest 20% of the world's population control 82.7% of the world's income. That's taken from Distribution of World GDP, 1989. Several criminology studies have found that 80% of crimes are committed by 20% of criminals. In the biology of pea pods, 80% of the garden peas are produced by only 20% of the pea pods. Now when it comes to sleep, virtually all sleep centers have shown in countless tests that 80% of your energy, reaction time, and so forth come from the first 20% of your sleep. And that might not be perfectly to scale there. Like I said, the numbers can vary, but basically the first two to four hours, for most people it's three hours of sleep, are the most essential. Which means that if you sleep through your first two sleep cycles without awakening, you might feel tired during the day, but you still have most of your energy. If you put your focus on the burdens of exhaustion, sleep becomes unrealistically important. I'll add there that whenever you focus on exhaustion, you find supporting beliefs or supporting evidence to explain, oh yeah, I am exhausted. And the more you focus on it, the worse it gets. So just by focusing on it, you can make it feel like you only have 20% of your energy when really you have 80%. If you instead focus on the energy you have, sleep becomes less important and you become more balanced and focused during the day. Remember, beliefs are very powerful because they direct all our focus and actions. An overwhelming belief must be confronted, taken care of, and eventually replaced. Change the belief that exhaustion is ruining your life and, makes, and make sleep less important. You can't change that belief overnight but you can start catching yourself saying, I have no energy, and replace the thought by saying, actually, I still have 80% of my energy. It just feels like I'm completely tired. The way to really drive this home and make a big difference is through catching these anti-sleep, exhaustion-driven ideas and replacing them with something called the energy spiral. So here's the upward spiral of energy. 
You can take control of your energy by giving yourself directions and following them regardless of how you feel. The key idea is just actually applying yourself and doing something creates energy in and of itself. Do you get that? Just actually applying yourself and doing something creates energy in and of itself. That's a very important concept. In a way, it's something you already know, but have probably lost touch with. Just think about the example of Marcus or Clara. Both gained energy when they were committed to doing the task at hand. Or think about any time that you felt completely exhausted, but ended up doing a hard task and got powerful feelings out of doing it. Doing anything creates energy just by the act of doing. However, this is counteracted by thinking about exhaustion. When you think about exhaustion, you drain energy by causing mental friction. So what is mental friction? Well, friction des describes how smooth something is. When there's a lot of friction, energy is used up. So mental friction describes how much emotional willpower or energy you are experiencing. Imagine you are doing some, you, well, imagine you have to do some heavy lifting and you approach it with the mental attitude of despair. You notice how heavy the object is and feel overwhelmed. You focus on the strain in your muscles. You can only lift for a few seconds before, before taking a breather. Now imagine that you have to do some heavy lifting and you approach it with eagerness. You believe in your own strength and want to prove to yourself that you're stronger than you look. You notice your ability to lift. You focus on pushing harder and you go as long as you can before you must stop for a breather. Which situation involved more energy? When you do something, you create energy, but if you do it in a way where you focus on the obstacles instead of the opportunities, you create mental friction that drains energy. The energy gained is balanced by the energy lost. Or in some cases, I'll, I'll add this, is that um, you lose more energy than you gain because you're so focused on how hard it is. If you can focus on doing something and think positively, you gain energy. However, if you focus on, some, on doing something and you think negatively, you lose energy. You can have beliefs that can support both the negative and the positive. So it's important to choose beliefs that will give you energy. I'd like you to make a commitment that you'll need to be consistent with. Commit to practicing creating energy by using positive focus at least once per day. It'll be great if you can do this as the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning. If you can consistently create energy at the start of every day, it will create a powerful habit that will allow you to see more opportunities and create more energy throughout the day every day. Just commit to doing it once per day. It won't take long for you to start seeing opportunities and wanting to use it more. And the more you use it, the less important sleep will be and the better your rest will be throughout the night. That's especially true because sleep is dependent on having energy during the day. There's actually rhythms in your body associated with energy that need to go up and down during the day. And if you don't produce energy during the day, these, rhythm, these rhythms get flat and make deep, refreshing sleep physically hard to get. Remember that the real enemy is focusing on exhaustion. So think about it this way, actually. This won't be on the slide, but if you want to write something down, something great to write down is that the first thing that's always going to happen, number one, is an obstacle or a problem is going to appear. Then the second step is to realize that the real enemy is not that obstacle. It's not the problem. It's the way you're reacting to it. And then the third step is to shut down that your reaction and express the natural proactiveness that results from that. Because when you react and uh, you know you go, oh man. I'm just so exhausted. I, I, I don't care. You know, I can't do this. You know, is that is whatever your task is the real problem there? Or is it the fact that you're not building up a good mental attitude to take it on? Right. It's, it's not the obstacle. It's the, it's the reaction. So that's a great thing to write down. First, an obstacle is going to happen. Second step is to realize that the real enemy is not that obstacle. It's your reaction. The third step shut down your reaction and express the proactive nature that comes from that. So remember that the real enemy is focusing on exhaustion. 
When you focus on how exhausted you are, the mental friction causes you to lose energy. Even with 80% of your energy coming from just a few hours of sleep, you can still feel as though you have no energy all day long if you continually focus on exhaustion. When you focus on the energy you have and doing things with it, you create energy. The more you do it, the stronger the habit, leading to an upward spiral of energy that looks like this. So you can see what's going on there. Focusing on an activity and enjoying it causes energetic activity in your mind, which leads to focusing more on the activity, which creates more energy. And that can be a spiral. If you can create that spiral, you'll be literally taking your life back from insomnia. So back to the questions I asked you in the very first video. What have you been giving up in your life? How much did you value those things? Feel free to pause the video and answer these questions because they will help. Next question. Do you suffer from anxiety, depression, pain, exhaustion, diminished focus, laziness, or anything else that's really bothering you because of lost sleep? Does the fact that you aren't getting enough sleep come up over and over again throughout the day? Are you feeling defeated or suppressed because of insomnia? In the beginning, I asked you to see how those things were making sleep more important. Now I want you to see how you can take your life back from insomnia and conquer those things without getting sleep. What can you take back that you previously gave up? What are all the activities that you can start doing? Which ones do you value the most and how will you revive them? Once again, it'd be really great if you could pause the video and answer these questions. How can you work on anxiety, depression, pain, exhaustion, diminished focus, or laziness, or anything else that you can become more powerful with despite exhaustion? How can you start catching and replacing thoughts of exhaustion and not getting enough sleep so that exhaustion isn't running the show anymore? What other ways can you start feeling victorious and free in life despite your exhaustion? Start figuring out where exhaustion is getting the best of you and find solutions to replace your old behaviors and beliefs. The next technique is one of the most powerful tools you can use for making any technique work successfully, including changing the way you think about sleep and exhaustion. It's the catch and replace technique. There's two very important principles that you need to know. The first one is, it is not enough just to catch. Every time you catch yourself, you must follow it by replacing the undesirable behavior. If you catch without replacing, all you're doing is making the negative behavior stronger by giving it more attention. So step two then is replace the behavior. To replace your behavior, reaction, belief, or really anything for that matter, you need to start by thinking about the exact situation you just caught yourself in. What exactly happened? Now think about how you would handle the exact situation with the replacement behavior. Kind of run it through in your mind. Visualize the new way as clearly as you can and see yourself doing it. So if you find yourself feeling exhausted during the day and you're thinking, I can't do this. If you can catch that thought, ask yourself, what did I just say? Then you might say, what would be a better thing to have said instead? You might replace the thought of I can't with I can, exhaustion might slow me down, but it doesn't have to stop me. Just doing that would then allow you to focus on the positive thinking and creating energy instead of creating that mind numbing mental friction. When you use catch and replace properly, it's almost like you never did anything wrong at all. You get a whole new feeling about the same situation. Catch and replace heals most damaging thoughts almost instantly. It makes you feel very satisfied. If, you, if your unhelpful thoughts or physical damage that you could see on your body, you'd be able to literally watch the damage heal in seconds using catch and replace. Here's some examples of using catch and replace along with self-therapeutic behavior. Following examples are adapted from Two Real Insomniacs that I helped during 2010. Note, you haven't learned all the techniques used in these examples. 
For each of the following situations, substitute your own problems in. Think about how a similar situation might relate to you. I may be talking about problems you don't have, but I'm showing how any sleep problems can use catch and replace. So try to figure out how it would work for you based on these examples. If you have a sleep journal that you're keeping, um, you can open that and just kind of look to see if anything that I'm saying applies to any of the things in your sleep journal. Father has been fired from his job, and he's not just worrying about the future of his children and his family. He's thinking about the very worst of what could happen. He's seeing his children not being able to afford college and his family living on the streets. He's overwhelmed with grief and burden. He's literally shaking and feels a crushing sensation inside his chest. It seems hopeless. After an hour of struggling, he realizes, he realizes that he's not getting anywhere and catches his behavior. It occurs to him that he could worry for hours and he should use it objectively. He starts replacing the behavior by writing down his problems and ideas he might have about solving them on a piece of paper which he puts on his nightstand. He says, I'm putting this behavior to the side so that I can replace it, get some sleep, and have a real chance at getting myself into a better situation. I'll work on my problems when I have a clear head. He decides to replace with pro-sleep thoughts. Of course, the feelings don't go away, but now he sits in bed thinking about how much he cares about his children and the love that exists within his family. He still feels overwhelmed, but now he also feels the comfort of love. He focuses on this feeling as much as he can for over an hour, using his obsessive thinking to think about all the feel feelings related to love in his family, which brings his mind to old family vacations, birthdays, and holidays. He starts reliving the past. As the nights go by, he gets better and better at replacing his ideas of catastrophe with ideas of comfort. Nothing happens right away, but he slowly changes from thinking about his problems at night to thinking about them during the day. He slowly becomes skilled at making himself feel warmer and more comfortable at night, and he finds that he's falling asleep within half the time it used to take and sleeping longer without awakening. One concept there that talk about in the DVD program that we haven't really covered I'm just gonna tell you about is a concept from the book sound sleep sound mind and they talk about this a lot which is the idea of ending your day really having a big cool down period at the end of the day which you relax and kind of have the day be over with so you don't carry it into the night okay so let's go to the next example now a young lady has tried everything she can imagine to put herself to sleep. Every night she struggles to fall asleep, trying to quiet her mind, trying to get more comfortable, and after learning about the downward spiral of insomnia, trying to convince herself that sleep isn't important. Instead of falling asleep, the opposite occurs. She feels more awake. Nothing is working. She stares at the ceiling for an hour, bored and upset, aggravated that she can't sleep even though her mind seems to be blank. She then realizes that even when she's not aggravated, her mind is still active. It's kind of like her mind doesn't want to sleep. She notices that even when she's not thinking at all, she still has an awake state of mind. She then decides that she can try to make a sleepy state of mind instead of letting insomnia run the show. She replaces her awakeness with comforting thoughts and techniques. She first practices a muscle relaxation technique. Then she practices a technique for breathing a certain way to slow down the mind. Seeing these not work, she starts getting frustrated again. She starts thinking about how nothing works. She starts noticing that she's being frustrated and catches herself again. She then replaces the frustration automatically with comforting thoughts. She reminds herself that these, that these skills have to be built, that she shouldn't expect to fall asleep at all. She feels a wave of tiredness wash over her. She keeps replacing she keeps up the replacement of pro-sleep actions. She starts thinking about the next day and how she would get by even if she didn't sleep at all. She tells herself that it's all going to be okay. She thinks of all kinds of comforting thoughts. She thinks of something her best friend said a few days ago, what it would be like to have extra energy all the time, getting a promotion at work, etc. Her mind gives into her fantasies and eventually she falls asleep. At first, she's not sure how much it's helping. Some nights it works, others it doesn't. After a few months of practicing, though, the results of faster, deeper sleep are clear. She's getting skilled at putting herself to sleep. 
How would catch and replace work for you? If you can take a minute to visualize yourself doing it, you'll be much more likely to actually do it. So the idea there, if you visualize anything before you do it, you're much more likely to not only do it, but to do a really good job. That just really helps to see yourself doing it. It's kind of like planning something out before you actually start. In the next video, I'm going to show you everything you can do to take your life back from exhaustion. You're going to discover advanced ways of getting leverage over your behaviors and beliefs, including neurolinguistic programming, mastering emotions, the skill of mindfulness, that really that skill should be taught in every school, and many, many other ways of mastering these areas of your life. I'm also going to show you all the quick fix techniques. I'll show you the physical things you can do to start sleeping right away, including diet, exercise, and nighttime tricks that improve sleep. So make sure to practice, and uh, something I'm going to mention as well here is you really need to be doing your sleep journal. And I know a lot of you don't want to work on your sleep journal. It's, it's daunting. It's something where you have to confront a lot of your thoughts, and you, it feels like you're making sleep more important or worse by looking at the negative thoughts. But it's really important to do it anyway because you need to really make it clear where the problems are so you can know exactly what to replace. It's very, very powerful to have them written down. Not only can you always check them for reference, not only can you write creative solutions and plan things you know, by having it on a piece of paper, not only does seeing it all the time help you remember, but just writing it down makes you 10 times more likely to get it not only just remembered, but very, really clear in your mind what, what's going on there. So it's really powerful stuff. So I'll see you next time. This has been James Cahoon.